Well, good morning. Is anyone else dealing with just a little, <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> something there in your throat this week, or just me? Yeah, harvest. It could be. It could be harvest. That, that's a very good possibility. You're right. Um, I know. It's going around. It is the season, is it not? It, it just is. Hey, one of the things as we get started this morning that I just want to do, uh, want to do with you is this. Um, as, a, as a youth pastor, as a, a teacher of students and young, young students even sometimes, I know one of the difficulties, one of the difficult things you would do is you would, you would open the Word of God with them and, and someone would begin reading, whether it was myself or one of the students or whatever else. And inevitably, you had somebody in the room that would get a little squirrely, do a little weird things, be talking, you know, do whatever. And so one of the things that I would often share them is this. I would say, okay, okay, guys, I want you to understand what we're doing. When we open the Word of God and we read from it, it is as if God himself is speaking directly to us. If God was in the room physically, you could see him and he was reading to you, would you be talking? Absolutely not. You would be on your face bowed before him. And so I would just remind them of this, of, hey, like, get in touch with what's happening here. Get involved with what's going on. And so as we study the word each and every week. Is, yeah? David's mic is on, but it set disappeared. He vanished. I don't know. We'll just, uh. We'll see if that wasn't it. We'll just, it's good. We'll just turn that one off. Maybe that'll fix it. We'll see. So it, it's all good, all right? Um, yeah, still a little reverb. He, he's got it. He's got it now. <laughs> That's what happens when the sound man leaves the room, even for a split second. It's crazy, but that is what happens. We're excited to begin this series with you guys. It's 40 days in the Word. Everybody joining us online, joining us here in, in house, um, it, it's going to be an impactful sermon series for you if. If, if you take it beyond just what we talk about on Sunday mornings and you dive into it further, you've got to be willing to do that really each and every week. For, for God's word to have an impact, you can't just read it, listen to it real quick, and then move on. We talked about that last week. We have to get to the point where we now begin to apply God's word in our life. We take what we learn, what we hear, and then we begin to implement it into our life. Remember, the heart of this series goes well beyond the six Sunday morning messages that we'll have as a part of this. Yes, there is a, a small group component, and we know not everybody's always going to be able to be a part of that. We get that, okay? But we want to let you know that there are small groups going. There are some small groups meeting, okay? Um, another women's Bible study on Sunday night just decided to be a part of this study as well, and so that's another group that's meeting. So there's lots of options. If you would like to get involved with one of those, put your name out on that sheet and say, yes, I would love to get involved with one of these studies, and we'll figure out a time, okay? There's a couple that meet on Sunday nights. Our group meets strictly online on Monday evenings. Um, there's a group now that's going to meet here on Thursday evenings at 6.30, and so just so you know, there are options that are available. There's, there's a group that meets on Monday night um, as well, and so they're going to do a hybrid, as I recall, talking to Cassie. Some people, I think, will be together in person, and some people will be online, Grandma and Grandpa. So um, they're going to do a, a fusion of the two. So there's lots of options, but we want you to get past just being here on Sunday morning. That is a great start. It's the place to start. It's absolutely essential to start in that moment. But you got to move past just being willing to be here on Sunday morning. So we are super excited to begin to get this series started with, with all of you. All right. We got a lot of ground to cover today. All right. There are seven items that we're going to cover today. So hang on because it's, it's about to, we're about to go, all right? It, it's going to go pretty quick, but you can keep up. I know. Hopefully, you have one of those two options in front of you, those note cards that are on your sheet, the outlines. will help you follow along as we get through it. But if you're a freelance person, then this little note card here is great, and the back doesn't even have lines. So you can do it however you want to do it on the back side of things, all right? So don't, don't miss out on those opportunities. We're going to start with a very, very famous passage, the words of Paul written to his uh, protege, his son in the faith, as he calls him, a man, a pastor an elder named Timothy. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, God's word says the following. It says, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the Son of Man may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now, we're going to study the end of that passage next week. All we're going to look at this week is the very beginning. All scripture is God-breathed. Now, what does that mean exactly? Well, some translations will we'll put that out there as it's God-inspired. Well, that's correct. It is an inspirational book, but it's, it's way beyond that. The authors were way beyond just being inspired and, and the book itself being inspired. No, these are actually the words of God spoken 
to man. It's an incredible thing. Paul writes that this is God's very breath. It's not just a good idea. It is God's word to us. And as a result of that, the psalmist wrote in Psalm 119, all of your commands can be trusted. Everything in the Bible can be trusted. Now, there's a lot of argument and there's a lot of debate about those things in this world that we live in today. So that's what we're going to talk about. It's one thing for the Bible to claim to be the word of God. It's a whole other thing to claim for the Bible to claim itself to be true. So how do we really know? How do I know that this, in fact, this book is the word of God? rather than just a bunch of stories and fables and things that have been assimil- accumulated over a long period of time. You must understand, for you, maybe you've just accepted this book as truth, and that is awesome because it is, but for a lot of people, they're stuck in this debate. They don't know whether they can trust this book. They don't know why they should trust this book. So it's up to us, it's up to believers to have the confidence in our faith and the confidence that this is God's word to share with them the truth about God's word. It's a legitimate question that people will ask when you try to share with them Jesus and the word of God. And so we pray this morning that at least for you personally, that your mind begins to be put at ease about this issue and that you can rely on this book being true. And then you will then go and share it with others. There are incredible proofs, countless incredible proofs that this book is in fact genuine. Okay, evidences, facts, things we're going to talk about some today. Obviously, we couldn't talk about them all, or this sermon would never, ever, ever end. All right, so so just keep that in mind. Our goal here this morning will start with is how can I trust the Bible? We're going to give you seven, count them seven different ways that we believe we can share with you that will help you learn that you can trust this to be the Word of God. One is a fun one for me because I love history. This book is historically accurate. It is incredibly historically accurate. It isn't just doctrinally accurate. It isn't just theologically accurate. It is accurate regarding morals and ethics, yes, but but it is true history. Real people, real places, real events at real times. Why is that important? Well, it's important because the Bible tells us, this book tells us, that God cannot lie. All right, so what does that mean? Well, people ask that question a lot. Maybe somebody's asked you, is there anything God, you're all powerful, almighty God, is there anything he can't do? And the answer is, well, yeah, actually there is. But they make perfect and complete sense because God cannot deny that he is God. He can't do that. And by not being able to deny that he's God, he cannot lie because God is truth. So those things have to coexist. He can't deny his very own existence. The Bible says in in the book of Hebrews, chapter 6, verse 18, it is impossible for God to lie because God is truth. It's the only reason that the universe even works is because our God is a God of truth, which means there are some things that are always, always, always true. Can you imagine if they weren't? What if the law of gravity was true sometimes? This would be a very different place, would it not? Yeah, the laws of, 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 of thermodynamics, the laws of physics, the laws of mathematics. What if they were just every once in a while happened to get it right? It'd be a very different place. God created these laws. He created all these things that the entire universe runs on and functions on and works together with. Therefore, they have to be true. The psalmist writes in chapter 33, verse 4, The word of the Lord is right and true. Not that it's just right and true about salvation, that's the case, but it is right and true about things like history. So how do we know? How do we know that the Bible is historically accurate? Well, we we put it through the same test as we would put any other historical document. What makes good history? One of the first questions that historians will ask is, is this good history, if it was based on reliable firsthand eyewitness accounts, then the answer is usually yes. They would ask, is this written down by somebody who actually witnessed the events or a secondhand information or thirdhand information or was it written down hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years after the event based on a legend? Well, the Bible is primarily firsthand eyewitness accounts. Moses was there when the Red Seas split. Joshua was there when the walls of Jericho fell down. The disciples of Jesus sat with him in the upper room when he was resurrected from the dead. And we read about it because they wrote it down. Matthew was there. He wrote it down. John was there. He wrote it down. Mark was probably not there. But he interviewed Peter, who was there and got him his information. Luke was not there, but Luke interviewed all kinds of people, including Jesus' very own mother, to get his information. So it was a very good firsthand eyewitness account. 
Another incredible way that you can evaluate history in this case is the extreme care which with, with which the Bible was meticulously copied down. It's an incredible process that it went through. Some of you might have even heard this argument before. There's an entire faith tradition based upon this lie that God's word, yeah, it might have been accurate back then, but over the years, it has gradually gotten mistranslated, misinterpreted, miswritten down, and that is simply not the case. There haven't been a lot of changes Come to the word of God. The Old Testament scribes had a process, a lengthy process, lots of rules that they had to follow in order to copy down God's word. When they copy from scroll to scroll, they did it much like we would use a copier or a scanner today. They had to be exact. They had to be precise. Rules like they had a specific number of columns on every single part of the scroll, and they didn't vary. It was either this or this, and it was the only options, and every one of those columns were exactly 30 characters in length, no more, no less. It was very simple. They didn't copy down word by word. They didn't copy things word for word. They copied things letter by letter. They copied things letter by letter, so they didn't accidentally write down the wrong word. Anybody ever have been typing on your phone? A text, shall we say, and maybe it put in a word that you didn't type? Mm -hmm. That's because it assumed it knew the next word. Well, you would do the same thing if you were copying down a document. They were not allowed to do such things. They copied letter by letter. They also knew how many letters, each letter of their alphabet, they knew how many letters were in each book. So say, for example, the letter A in our language. There was 1,653 A's in that particular book. When they got done, guess what they did? They counted the number of A's. If there was 1,654, they got rid of it and started over. Yeah, that would stink, wouldn't it? <laughs> they couldn't hit the backspace key. They couldn't do type. They couldn't autocorrect. They couldn't do anything, though. They had to actually start over. They were so exact that they knew the middle letter, the middle letter of the first five books, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, they knew the absolute middle layer. Once they got done copying it down, they would find that middle letter. They would count forward and backwards, and those two numbers had to be equal. And if they weren't, guess what? Time to start over. Now it's the whole five books that you're recopying. Incredibly detailed process. I would not even want a part of that job. It would be awful for me. But they were doing it out of worship to their God. That's why they were so dead set on getting it absolutely perfectly right. Imagine the intensity that went in with Scribing those things down, writing those things, copying those things down. Now you ask, how do we know that they were this accurate? Well, it just so happens that not that long ago in the course of world history, we found these documents. We found these documents called the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now you might know or might not know what they are or were, okay? They're still around. They're an incredible batch of documents that were found. And these documents contain copies of all of the Old Testament books, except the book of Esther. There's a reason for that. We'll talk about that later in life, maybe. But they contain all the Old Testament books. Here's why they were so cool. At that point in history, the oldest recorded versions of the Old Testament scriptures that we had were from about 900 years after Jesus had lived. Okay? But these were from 100 years before the time of Christ. So now we have two documents, a thousand years apart. We can set them beside each other because they're written in the same language, and we can compare and say, how accurate were these scribes? Well, as it turns out, they were within about 5% error. Those original documents from a thousand years ago to the newer ones that had been found. Most of those errors were spelling variances in particular words and punctuation there were a few other things that were a little different, but less than 5%. It was an incredible discovery to prove the authenticity of God's word. We find proof in archaeology, digging stuff up. It's amazing. We can dig stuff up and we just find more and more and more places and events and things that occurred in God's word that a lot of people never thought even happened. We can go right now. We can get it. Well, maybe not right now, but in reality, if things ever go back to normal, we could go and we can go visit the places that Paul visited, the exact locations where he spoke to people. We can visit the temples. We can visit the Herod's. Uh, temple. We can visit all kinds of the Pool of Siloam, the, the, the walls of, of, of Jerusalem. There are so many things we can go and physically see and touch and experience that are written about in God's Word. The book of Acts is also a historical book. It's not just a biblical book. Luke was a historian as well as a, a uh, physician. And he talks about 39 different co countries, 54 different cities, nine different islands, and every single one of these things are absolutely historically accurate and true. The cool thing about the Bible is not only has it been proven true time and time again, there have been times where our history has been wrong. And the Bible 
goes, no, no, actually it happened like this. For years and years and years, people debated and argued whether Solomon was ever really actually a real person. And if, in fact, he was, there's no way that he had horses because horses didn't exist in that part of the Middle East until they found Solomon's stables for his chariots and his horses in Megiddo, and they went, oh, well, I guess there were horses. Then there's this ancient culture called the Hittites that for centuries historians said never existed because the only document on planet Earth that referenced the Hittites was the Bible until the early 1900s where a man found 10,000 clay tablets describing the Hittites in their city capital. And now, of course, the entire world believes in the Hittites. There's example after example after example of those things happen. The Bible has proven to be historically accurate. And while that may or may not be important for you, because you believe someone that's seeking, someone that's searching, this kind of information can cause them to at least ponder, that's weird. How would that book get that right when so many other things have gotten it wrong? Now, the second one is a very controversial one. The second reason that you can trust this to be God's word is because it is scientifically Accurate. Now, I know we're opening a can of worms there. I understand. The reality is so much has been misunderstood and even quite honestly lied about in today's world in relationship with God's word, the truth that God created the laws of science. He made sure when his word was written that nothing in his word contradicted science because he invented all of these laws. The Bible was not given to us as a scientific textbook, although... It can be used as such. It doesn't contain a ton of scientific language. If you think about it, most of that's from Latin. Anyway, that language wasn't even around during the times that the Bible was written. So think about that. The Bible has never ever in its 1600 plus years now given us bad science. As the book was written, it doesn't give bad science. As a matter of fact, it's always a little ahead of where the scientific curve is. What the Bible said is true from the very beginning, and there are things there that we are just now starting to discover in spite of our scientific methods. Famous mathematician and astronomer Johann Kepler said this, science is simply thinking God's thoughts after him. We're just figuring out how God did all of these things. In other words, God established the laws of physics, and then we discover them. He, he established the laws of biology, the laws of mathematics, and then we discovered them. Although mathematics, some of us are still working on, but that's a whole other story. One of the reasons we know why the Bible can be trusted is because of its scientific accuracy. And there's a reason it's accurate. Because God invented the laws of the universe. Therefore, they're true. And there's one thing about truth. It doesn't change. Truth simply doesn't change. However, if you're familiar with science... It does, doesn't it? It's always evolving. It's always changing. There's always new theories. I guarantee you, if you went back to a third grade classroom right now, and you had your third grade classroom textbook from science back in the day, and you compared the two, you'd be like, these are not the same. As a matter of fact, a lot of the things in your science textbook probably aren't believed or taught at all anymore. They've been replaced by new theories, new science that exists. Theories are constantly changing. If you read the Bible a thousand years ago, what the Bible says probably wouldn't have matched the science of the day. Why? Because they hadn't discovered it yet. The psalmist records in Psalm 148, let everything, every created thing, that's the whole universe, give praise to the Lord for he issued his command. God set these rules in motion and they came into being and he established them forever and ever and his orders will never be revoked. The laws of gravity, as I said earlier, don't work today and then all of a sudden not work tomorrow. Thank you, Jesus, for that being the case. They're always going to work because they're always true unless God changes that or eliminates that truth. He won't alter the truth, but he could just delete gravity from all existence in the case of deleting the planet from all existence if he wanted to do that. Truth doesn't change. And one of the really cool things that you can evaluate this through is almost through a, an opposite kind of research. You can believe that the Bible is scientifically true because and that it wasn't made by man. It is from men and women who have been inspired by God to say and speak things into his word. Yes, there are women. They didn't write down the Bible, but you definitely hear their voice in the Bible, don't you? And you hear these things because one of the cool things you see in the Bible is what's not in it. Think about this concept for a moment. If this were a human book, we would expect it to be filled with the scientific facts of the day. 
When the Bible was written, the things and the thoughts that were being processed by all of humanity during that time would have found their way into this book, but they're not there. For instance, let me give you a really easy one. For thousands upon thousands upon thousands of years, mankind believed that the earth was flat. Hmm. Interesting, because that never comes up in God's word. It wasn't until the, the likes of Copernicus and Galileo and some guy named Columbus that we figured out, oh wait, this thing is actually a big sphere. You would expect the Bible somewhere in there, somebody, a poet like David, to write about the flatness of the earth, right? But they never, ever did. As a matter of fact, if you really get really specific, more than 2,000 years ago, God inspired the prophet Jeremiah with these words. Chapter 40, verse 22. God is enthroned above the sphere of the earth. Now, how would Jeremiah, who well, he didn't, he didn't, as a matter of fact, no one would have even believed that at the time. But there it is, the truth in God's word 2,000 years before we ever knew it to be true. It was written, no one believed it, God said it, and it was true, whether we believe it or not. For thousands of years, people believed that the earth was hung by something in space. It couldn't just be floating around out there. There's got to be something, and it depended on where you were from on planet earth, depended on what you believed. And if you were Greek, of course, you believed that the Greek god Atlas held up the earth. If you were Indian, then you believed that it was on the back of elephants, and the myths go on and on and on. But you won't find any of those myths in God's word, even though those were the things prevailing in that culture, in that region at the time that this book was written. But it's not there. Instead, we find much earlier, and I do mean much, in the book of Job, all of the world believes that this document is one of the oldest written documents on planet Earth. That's without exception. Non-religious people believe the book of Job is that ancient. It's the first book of the Bible ever written down. In the book of Job, chapter 26, verse 7, it says, God stretches out the sky over empty space and hangs the earth on nothing. <laughs> How did Job know that? <laughs> he didn't. Of course he didn't. God revealed it to him. Why? Because the Bible only and always tells the truth. For years, it was accepted science that there were a fixed number of stars in the sky. It was based completely on what we could see and observe. That number, early 2nd century B.C., was 1,022. There were 1,022 stars, and that was accepted for 150 years until, of course, they found four more, 1,026 stars now in the entire universe. Well... If you're familiar with science these days and the telescopes we have in space and things, we're finding not just new stars, new planets, but entirely new galaxies every day. It just happens. We just keep counting and counting and counting. There is no end. As a matter of fact, there are people now that believe that maybe the universe is infinite? Oh, wait, that's like backwards from 1,022 stars total, right? That's a little different. Well, if you go back 2,600 years to the book of Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah, God said these words to him. <laughs> the number of stars are, in fact, infinite. You can't count them. It's not possible. I guess nobody read that. Nobody remembered that that was in there. Nobody considered that because science knows better, right? We can trust what God has to say about biology, about chemistry, about physics, about medicine. In this recent pandemic we've been going through, we've heard of some of these older pandemics, the bubonic plague, for example. You've heard a lot about that one. Killed one-fourth of the continent of Europe. I, I don't think we can grasp the magnitude of that. I really don't, okay? The, the destruction, the devastation, the sadness, the grief that went along with that event in the world, all right? But why did that happen? What happened? Because we didn't understand what was going on. We didn't know what caused it. We didn't understand germs. We didn't understand how things were spread. So you had healthy people interacting all the time with unhealthy people spreading the disease. People just kept dying, kept dying, kept dying. The unfortunate reality is if those people in those positions in that time would have read God's word, then they could have got some advice that would have been very, very helpful. Because if you go all the way back to the time of Moses in the book of Leviticus, God told them, hey, if an outbreak, uh, outbreak of a disease comes into your camp, here's how you solve it. Leviticus chapter 13, verse 4, put the infected person in quarantine out of the camp for seven days. That's thousands and thousands of years before we ever had any clue what a germ was. God says, here's how you take care of it. Take the person that's sick with that disease. Take them out of the camp for seven days. If at the end of seven days they're not better, leave them out there another seven days. Wait a minute. That's 14 days of quarantine. 
I've heard that somewhere recently, haven't I? God's word doesn't lie, people. Think the time of Moses, how long ago that was, and we're in 2020, and we know everything, and we're following God's orders. Shocking. Not at all. Nobody understood quarantine. Nobody understood germs then, like we do today. God shared it with us. The Bible is always scientifically accurate. It's ahead of the science. God knows more than we do. Proverbs 30, verse 5 says, Every word of the Lord is flawless. Minds aren't flawless. I've messed up so many times a day, you would have no idea. Okay? So many times. And you will as well. But his word is flawless. It's not only flawless. The author of Psalms writes it this way in 12.6. The word of the Lord are flawless like silver refined in a furnace of clay and purified seven times over. They're perfect. We know we can trust the Bible because it's historically accurate. Archaeology confirms it. We know it's scientifically accurate. There's so many examples of that. But we also know the Bible is true because it is prophetically accurate. Now, this deals with a topic only found in God's Word. You can't really rely on outside sources except for other historical documents to prove the accuracy of the prophecies. What does this mean? It means the Bible predictions, what the Bible predicts, always come true. The Bible is filled with thousands and thousands and thousands of prophecies. Places where God says, this is, this is going to happen in such and such a time and in such and such a way. And over the centuries, thousands of these have already been fulfilled. Every one of them exactly as God has said. Now, if you're studious, you know there's a lot of prophecies still yet to be fulfilled. And just like the people of biblical times, we don't know when, we don't know how, and we can't really predict it. And probably when it happens, we won't recognize it. You might say, oh, no, I will. Right, I'm sure the Jews thought they wouldn't understand when the Messiah arrived, didn't they? They didn't get it. So don't think we're that much smarter, okay? When those things begin to happen, we might observe. There were a select few during Jesus' day that did, but that was a small, small, small number. Over the centuries, these thousands of things have come true. There's over 300 prophecies about the Messiah alone. Could you imagine what it would be like to predict thousands of years before, a thousand years before the time of Christ? Begin to predict everything that would happen about when he was going to be born, how he was going to be born, ultimately how he would die. If I tried to predict 300 things about you, how many of those would I possibly get right? Probably very, 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 very few. The, the numbers are astronomical. To predict all the things that came true with Jesus, impossible scientifically. If we just take eight of them, if we just take eight of them, so eight random prophecies about Jesus, he's going to be born in Bethlehem. The Messiah is going to be, is going to be preceded by a messenger, that would be John the Baptist. He's, he's going to enter Jerusalem on a donkey, that's pretty random. He's going to be betrayed by a friend. He's going to be sold for 30 pieces of silver. The money that he was sold for, well, that gets thrown to the potter in God's house. Messiah is to be silent before his accusers, and then ultimately, he's going to be executed by something called crucifixion. The odds of those eight prophecies coming out, mathematicians tell us, is a number you cannot see or, or understand. I cannot either. 10 to the 17th power. That's one with 17 zeros behind it. I can't tell you the name of that number because I don't know it has a name, but it's impossible. It's scientifically impossible for those things to actually play out. And furthermore, if Jesus was just a man, there's no way he could create for himself where he was going to be born, how he was going to be born, who his parents were, or even how he would ultimately die. You don't get to pick and choose those things in life, nor did Jesus. The reality is it takes more faith to believe that this is all just a coincidence than it does to believe that there's actually a God who planned it. It takes enormous faith to believe this is all just a bunch of random coincidences that all just happened without a designer, without a creator. A, a thousand years before Jesus went to the cross, David had penned words about crucifixion and how Jesus would ultimately die. The problem was nobody had invented crucifixion yet. The word wasn't used because David didn't know what to call it. He just described it. It's incredible. The Romans hadn't even been in existence yet when David was writing about these ideas of crucifixion. How did David know that this is the way the Messiah would ultimately offer up his life other than God must have told him? The book of Revelation, which was written by the Apostle John, in chapter 22, John writes these words. The angel said to me, these words are trustworthy and they are true. Why? Because they're from God. The Lord sent his angel to show his servants that the things, the things that must soon take place. It is prophetically accurate. 
And as I said, the odds of these prophecies coming true in the way they have are really, quite honestly, astronomical. Yet they have. All right? Fourth reason. Fourth reason that I know that the Bible is trustworthy is that it is thematically unified. Now, if you're a reader, then this doesn't really mean much to you because the fact that the Bible has a consistent theme from Genesis to Revelation, this theme of redemption from Genesis to the end where Jesus is now the star. Now, if you're a reader, again, this isn't a big deal to you because you've read lots of books that have a consistent theme from beginning to end. Some of you might have read the Harry Potter series and so you have a million pages that you've read and they have the same theory from beginning to end, right? The same exact people and characters, all that good stuff. But the reality is the Bible, I, I just challenge you to say, okay, that's great. Your, your books have those consistent themes. I just want to ask a question. Was that book written over the course of 1,600 years? Okay, how about by 40 different authors? Three different languages, three different continents. None of those things are true. Okay, a little easier for one person to write a book that has a consistent theme, but 40 authors that have never met each other because this book wasn't put together until after they were all dead. A little harder, a little harder to put that one together. If it was all written by one person, it, it makes sense. But over 1,600 years, they got the same story. And what's so cool is who wrote these books, poets and prophets, Princes and kings, sailors and soldiers, attorneys, even a doctor, prisoners, common people, all types of folks wrote this book, and they all came up with the same theme of redemption from cover to cover over a period of 1,600 years. It's incredible. Jesus said in the book of Luke, chapter 24, verse 27, beginning with Moses, that's the first five, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, and all the prophets, that's the rest of the Old Testament, Jesus explained to them what was said in the scriptures concerning himself and who he was. You see, most people think that the New Testament is about Jesus, and they're right, but they think that the Old Testament is about Israel or some other historical type of thing, and that's not right. No, the Old Testament is about well, it's about Jesus the same way. And that is what he's saying. He's talking about the Old Testament. He says he's gone through the Old Testament scriptures with them. He showed them what it said about him. The story is about Jesus, beginning to end. Pictures, metaphors, analogies, allusions. Everything in scripture from beginning to end points to God's plan to redeem his people and to build a family of God for all eternity. And it all began with Jesus, the star of the story. And he's in every single book. In John chapter 5, verse 39, we mentioned this last week, Jesus said, you search the scriptures because you believe they give you eternal life. He's agreeing with them. But the scriptures point to me. He's saying, I'm actually the one that gives eternal life. And oh, by the way, I am the word. Uh-oh. Oh, now I'm confusing everybody because it's all tied up together. Remember, the Old Testament hasn't been written when Jesus right, or says these words. He's talking about the Old Testament, the verses, the, the books that they have in their hands. And all of those scriptures point to him. A fifth reason we can trust the Bible is because it's confirmed by Jesus. This is one of my favorites. The fact that Jesus confirmed that God's word is true. You might have heard or even thought yourself, hey, you know what? I believe in Jesus. I believe his teachings, I believe his words, they're good. That's good stuff. But the rest of that stuff, I just have a hard time swallowing. Like some of it just doesn't seem real. Like it's not really possible for those things to happen. Well, here's the challenge to that line of reasoning. Jesus believed that those things happened. He references those things. So if I trust Jesus and what Jesus believes and what Jesus says, and he trusts the rest, then where does that leave me? <laughs> right? Matthew chapter 5, verse 18, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, under heaven and earth, yeah, until heaven and earth, sorry, <laughs> disappear, not a, the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. And Jesus looks at the Bible and he says, it's going to last until the end of time. It's going to last until God accomplishes everything God has said he's going to accomplish in his word. Jesus proclaimed and he believed the truth of God's word. When you read it, when you read Jesus talk about the Bible, he would often talk about very specific instances, very specific phrases, and even very specific words in Scripture when he was teaching. So if he believed those things were true, why shouldn't I? When he talks about God's Word, he doesn't just talk about it as a book of history or as a book of poetry. He talks about it as a book that should change your life. Luke eleven twenty eight. here's what Jesus said. Be blessed rather... 
are those who hear the word of God and obey it. They allow it to transform it. They don't just read it like history. They don't just read it like poetry, but they obey it because God wrote it into our lives. He talked about the Bible as if it's a real book, talking about real people, talking about real places, about a real God who is really at work on this planet. Jesus believed in the prophets. He references many of them. Prophets, things like Daniel. He believed in Noah. He believed in the flood. He believed in Adam and Eve, the tragedy of Sodom and Gomorrah, and yes, the story of Jonah. Jesus recognized every single one of those, and there's something really strange about those particular ones that Jesus calls out. You see, in our culture today, those particular stories are the ones most often attacked as not being real. They have to be fables. And yet Jesus specifically 2,000 years ago brought those up. You think that's a coincidence? Or you think he knew that we would never be able to believe these things? So he's like, hey, you need to believe these things because they really happened. Oh, by the way, I was there when they happened. And so I'm just relying to you. Yep, that's real. Yep, that's true. Yep, it happened. It's up to you. A lot of people will tell you they're good moral stories. They got good, good, good illustrations. That's great. But see, Jesus pointed to them as examples of what was going to happen for his Resurrection. Jesus believed in a literal Jonah. He believed it really happened. I don't know how God did it. I don't have a clue. But I believe he did. Because Jesus believed and trusted in it. And so who are we, two, three, four thousand years later to look back at God's word and go, you know what, I'll believe some of this over here, but, but you know what, I'm not really going to believe in that over there based on my subjective, my emotional, my thoughts, my theories. Are we going to rely on those things? Jesus trusted it. Here's the thing. It takes faith. Yeah. It's not all going to be spelled out for us, believers. And when we're trying to share Christ with others, there's going to be questions that they ask that we might not have an answer to. And that's where faith has to come in. And we're not talking about blind trust, blind faith. We're giving you example after example after examples of things you can point to. But there comes an element where there's going to have to be some faith involved. You might not quite be there yet. That's okay. That's okay. Keep spending time in God's word. Allow him to build that trust for you in his word. And here's the awesome part. It's not my job to convince you. That is the work of God through the Holy Spirit within you that will bring you to a place where you trust and believe in his word as truth. Sixth reason. Almost there. You got two left. Sixth reason. This is the big one. You can trust God's word because it has survived every attack you can imagine from mankind. It is a very unusual book, okay? It's the most despised, the most disdained, denied, disputed, disrespected, debated, even destroyed, and outlawed book in all of human history. Millions upon millions of people have given their life for this book and their unwillingness to give it up or to give up what it stands for. It's still illegal in many countries across the globe today. The Bible has been an under attack for centuries by everything and everyone you can possibly imagine, yet it's still the most read, the most translated, the most passed out all over the entire, it's not even close to any other document on planet Earth. And oh, by the way, this book is still changing people's lives. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 35, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. This is the only thing on this planet that will not be burnt up in the end. The word of God will remain. It's eternal, everything else, because truth, well, truth lasts forever. There was a famous French man who went by the pen name of Voltaire. He existed during the Enlightenment phase. He was actually a big author during the Enlightenment phase. And, and he wrote lots of things discrediting the Bible. He hated the Bible. I think that's probably an understatement. If you read, I read lots of documents about him trying to actually find this specific quote, which I couldn't find. But lots of, docu lots of other quotes just as vile and worse about God's word. And, and so he's famously said this one thing, although the tract which he allegedly recorded this in has been lost to history. He said simply this. He said, um... The Word of God, the Bible, a hundred years from now, well, the Bible will be a forgotten book. The Enlightenment was a long time ago, if you didn't know that. 
pretty sure we're still reading from it this morning. But that goes without saying. After he passed away, something fairly ironic happened. The, the French Bible Society took ownership of his home and they began selling and distributing Bibles out of his home for the next hundred years. <laughs> Take that for what you will. That's actually historically true. Most people have no idea who that man is because heaven and earth will pass away, but the word of God will never pass away. First Peter Chapter 1, verse 24, the Apostle Peter writes these words, The grass withers, the flower fades. In other words, temporary stuff is just that. It wilts, it goes away. Today's news, absolutely, completely worthless tomorrow. Nobody's going to read last week's newspaper unless you just happened to find it and didn't realize you hadn't already read it. But then you read it going, man, that's old. Like, I don't even know what's going on. Anyway, okay, you move on. The Word of God stands forever. The truth will always be the truth, whether I believe it or not. Some of you might have seen the bumper sticker or t-shirt or poster that, that said something to this effect. God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. That sounds like a very firm statement, doesn't it? Yes, that's like rock solid. That's a put, something to stand on. Actually, it's completely wrong. What if I told you that? It's completely wrong. It, it should say something like this. God said it. That settles it. Whether I believe it or not doesn't matter. Because our opinion isn't relevant. If God said it, then it's truth. It doesn't change anything. The fact is, there's a lot of things I wish wasn't true. There's probably a lot of things you wish really weren't true. But the fact that I don't believe in it or I don't want it to be true does not change the fact that it is true. For example, I could tell you that I don't believe in the law of gravity. You know, it's great for you, but really not so much for me. Don't care doesn't really apply to me. So you and I, we take a stroll up to the top of the Empire State Building. I firmly declare my belief in the non-existence of gravity. And I say, au revoir. And I jump off. I had to throw a little... And anyway, so I, I jump off that building and I begin to fall. About the 100th floor, somebody sticks their head out the window and says, hey, how's that going for you? I say, hey, you know what? It's going great right now. Because I haven't experienced the full effect of gravity just yet. Have I? Now, as humorous as that illustration might be, that's exactly how people are living their lives today. You see, God gives us the freedom to pretend and live our lives as if the truth doesn't exist. And we can go through this life and people can check in with us and everything is okay. It's all right. I'm doing okay. It's just fine. I don't believe in your God. I don't believe in God's word. I don't think any of that is true. And you can exist in this life just like I can fall off that building. But at some point in time, I'm going to hit the ground. And I'm going to experience the full effect of gravity. And at some point in time, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess and they will experience the reality of the God that they chose not to believe in. And no one wants that to happen for them. God gives us the freedom in this life to live however we choose. If you're listening today and you've never believed in the truth of God and His Word, then I challenge you today to consider that one day you won't have a choice but to accept this truth. Why not accept it today? Even if it's hesitantly, that's okay. God doesn't care. Come to him as you are. Let him then convince you the rest of the way. Just we ask that you be open to the possibility that he is true, that he is real, that he does in fact exist. You see, you can't change a human behavior by laws, can you? How many laws do we have on the books? How well does it Work. We see it every day. Politics, well, that's probably not going to solve the greatest issues on our planet. We've probably all figured that out by now. You can make all the laws in the world, but they'll never change the heart. You can make a law that outlaws racism if you want, but it's never going to turn a racist into a lover, is it? The only thing that has a potential of doing that is the word of God. God has to change the heart Fortunately for me and hopefully for you, God has called me into the heart-changing, life-changing business instead of some of those other avenues that we could be involved in. Jesus famously said these words, and we've talked about it before. In John chapter 8, verse 31, you if you continue in my word, the truth, then you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. God wants us all to be free. All of humanity has given us the power within his freedom to be absolutely free on this earth. Secular universities, businesses, all kinds of organizations, they love to quote the very last part of that verse. The truth will make you free. And that is true. But they forget to acknowledge the source, the only source of truth. 
They ignore God and they ignore his word. That first part, if you continue in my word, if you continue in the truth, his word is the only source of truth. He is the only source of truth. Then I, the truth, will make you free. If you don't realize that Jesus is the truth, the truth is of no value to you. Here's the thing. This book never lies. It never lies, even when I don't like what it says. <laughs> even when it makes me angry. Even when it upsets me. Even when it hurts. Even when it's uncomfortable. This book continues to tell me the truth. And I don't always like what it has to say. And you won't either if you get too deep into it. But it's truth. Do you believe everything you read online? <laughs> How about everything you hear on the nightly news? Newspaper? No. Yet why do we spend so much time reading those sources of lies when we have the complete truth access all the time 24/7 And that's for believers. That's for believers. The most important question that you might ask yourself as we get through this is this one last reality. You see number 7 the final one. The interesting thing about the final one is it might be the most subjective of all of them, but yet it might be the most relevant to culture today, and it's this. The Word of God has transforming power. Nothing can change the lives of people like the Word of God. My life's been changed by it. I pray that your life has been changed by it as well. In fact, billions of lives have been changed by the power of the Word of God. There's no sin, no lifestyle, no addiction, nothing, no destructive behavior that the Word of God has not proven itself to be able to overcome if someone will just rely on it. Anyone who is willing to listen to the Spirit-inspired Word of God can have their lives transformed in this moment. They become godly husbands, loving and caring, wonderful forgiven mothers, reformed criminals, recovering addicts, and even more. And even more. The reality of, of this book and the question that we must ask ourselves today is, is our life going to be based on the Word of God? Or will it be based on the world? What is going to be the final authority for your life? Honestly, you individually need to decide that. And I'll press you a little further. I would challenge you to decide it today. What good is it in walking out this room going, you know, I don't know. I don't know what I want to be the final authority in my life. So do I want to be the final authority in my life or, or would I rather God be the final authority in my life? I'm going to debate this. I'm going to think about this for a little while. Am I going to listen to what God says is truth or am I going to listen to public opinion or my own feelings? Who is it going to be, God? Or is it going to be me? Now, what's the reason? What would be the reason I don't want to accept God as the final authority in my life? Is it because I want to be boss? I want to make all the decisions, call the shots? I want to be God of my own life? I don't need God telling me what to do or not do, what's moral or, or immoral, what's right, what's wrong. I want to do it my way. Well, there's a question that goes along with that. How's that working out for you? Is that solving all of your problems, you being your own God, does that make you less depressed, <laughs> more confident, less anxiety? You see, the reality of rebelling against God, it's futile in this life, but ultimately it's fatal for the next. You're never going to win that battle with God. This book, this incredible book is the only book, the only book that tells you that your life <laughs> is not an accident. You see, science doesn't share that with you. Matter of fact, it tells you the exact opposite. This book is the only one that tells you that there's a purpose, an overarching purpose for your existence in this world. <laughs> the world certainly doesn't tell you that. God, in this book, tells us that he made us, he created us. Why? So that he could love us. You're not going to hear that anywhere else. This book tells you that you can be forgiven, that your past can be Erase. No other book is going to share that information with you. This book says that no matter what you're going through, no matter what problems that you're experiencing in life, that God can take those issues, He can take those things, and through God alone, He can use it for good in your life. And this book gives us the only reason at all for hope in this current lifetime. 
Paul wrote in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. We've read it before. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. That's the way that the world thinks about things. A world, world view. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Here's the reality. You're either going to be a conformist or you're going to be a transformist. You're going to be conformed into what the world thinks and what the world wants you to think or you're going to be transformed by the word of God. And then, if you're transformed, you'll be able to test God's word. You'll be able to test his will. You're going to make good decisions. You're going to approve of it, and you're going to understand his good, pleasing, and perfect will. God's plan for your life is good. It is pleasing, and yes, it is perfect according to God. But you're only going to know that through the study of his word. We don't want you to miss this. It's so important. If you have never made that confession. You have never made that decision to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, whether you're online watching today, because you never know who might watch this or when, or you're in-house today reading along with us, studying along with us, then don't miss this moment. If you've never made that decision, you literally have jumped off the Empire State Building, and you're believing that your life is just fine and everything is just fine, ignoring the law of gravity, ignoring the truth of Jesus Christ and what it says in his word. But at some point in time, we will have to deal with the truth. And no one, no one, God included, wants anyone to deal with that reality apart from knowing his son. So if you've never made that confession, then today is the day. Father God, as we step before you this morning, I just pray that minds and hearts are softened to your word. Father, people love to get argumentative when we talk about God's word. They love to try to discredit it. They, they have their theories. They have their talking points. They have all their things that they rely on. But Father, ultimately, the truth will win. And whether I know the answer to refute whatever it is they're claiming or not, it does not discount the truth. I pray that what you've given people today is a glimpse into the reality of the truth of your word and some of the ways that we can begin to study it on our own and realize the truth behind it and then share that. Father, you give us this information, you give us these things for a reason. And so if we are out and we're bidding, doing your bidding, we're doing your calling, we're out reaching and talking with people that don't know you yet, then somebody soon is going to ask us, why do you believe the Bible is true? How can you know it's true? And something you've provided for us in this moment is going to be recalled instantly to memory and we're going to be able to share that with this person and they're going to be blown away because they didn't know that. No one has ever shared with them the truth of God's word and that's what you've given us to do. Father, today if there's anyone that has never responded to this truth and maybe today for the first time they have that spiritual feeling inside of them, they've been convicted and all of a sudden they realize the truth is real. Father, that Jesus, you are the truth and you have come to set them free and they want to accept that free gift today. Then I pray whether online or in person, they reach out to us, communicate with us and allow us to follow up and show them what that truth is all about. Father, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.